1967. Protests erupt against the Vietnam War. The Concorde is shown for the very first time. Elvis marries Priscilla. And this car, the Monteverdi 375 High Speed, is launched. This Swiss supercar looks, at first glance, very similar to the Aston Martin DBS. But neither plagiarised the other because they were launched at the same time in 1967. Also, the DBS was designed by William Towns, whereas this version of the Monteverdi was done by Fissore in Italy. Peter Monteverdi founded the company in Basel, Switzerland. Before he built this car, he was already a very successful distributor of high-end Italian cars in Switzerland, including Ferraris. Like Enzo, Peter was reputed to have a little bit of a temper, so it was only a matter of time before the two fell out. And indeed, that's exactly what happened. Enzo asked for a payment up front for 100 cars. Peter told him to get stuffed and decided to build his own car. As Richard, the owner of this car, just told me, if Enzo had been a nicer guy, we would be much poorer of a lot of interesting cars. In the case of this one, this is what's known as a hybrid. So it has a European chassis with all the advantages that that brings and a great big stonking 7.2 litre Chrysler V8, which brings power, simplicity and reliability. There are many notable things about the Monteverdi, but we have to talk about the price because that is particularly interesting. This was a new starter, but that didn't stop Peter from pricing this more than a Lamborghini Espada, a Ferrari Daytona, a Jensen FF, which was probably its more natural competitor, was about half the price. To give you an idea, a Daytona was 6,700, a Lamborghini Espada was 7,900, the Jensen was 5,365, the Iso Grifo, a similar kind of car, 5,500, and this, the Monteverdi High Speed, in 1968 was priced at £10,450. Let's see if it was worth that money. I'm sure you'll agree with me that 375 high speed is a pretty cool name for a car, but there is a solid reasoning for it. When Monteverdi decided to take on Ferrari, he already had a wealth of experience behind him on the kind of cars that his clients actually wanted. And generally speaking, they didn't want, they wanted the prestige of the Ferrari, but they didn't want the unreliability, the finicky nature, the bad build quality. At the time, you have to realize that flights were still very much in their infancy. So if you wanted to go in between European cities on business, for example, perhaps from Milan to Zurich or Milan to Paris, generally speaking, you wouldn't fly, you would drive. This was built as the perfect object to get you from A to B in high speed, comfort and luxury. Now they were made between 1967 and 1976, initially by Frua, so that's another carrozzeria in Italy. I think that Frua only made 10 cars, I mean production numbers are very much, um, accurate production numbers are very much difficult to get hold of, but in any case, Frua started off the original design, that was let's call it a series one car, does look quite different to this, especially at the front end where it's got a more rounded profile. But the reason why he had to change the design is that, surprise, surprise, the fiery Peter fell out with Frua when they couldn't supply as many cars as he needed. He wanted to go to another carrozzeria to, that could provide more, so he went to Fisore. But he tried to take the design with him and lost a court case against Frua and they had to modify the car to keep on producing it. As you can see from the pricing, this really was the Rolex of cars, and they were very luxuriously appointed as well. There is leather everywhere, the interior is really rather nice, pretty well built, one would think. But it's interesting to note that 
when Autocar tested one of these in 1969, so it would have been a Fissure made car, so perhaps that's why quality dipped. But in any case, when they tested it then, it had all sorts of problems. So the windows, the electric windows broke, the belts would jump off the engine on full lock, there were fuel leaks, all sorts of things, which nowadays would be enough to sink a car. But you've got to remember, back in the 60s and 70s, cars were nowhere near as perfect as they are today. As part of the philosophy of what Monteverdi wanted to do to make this usable, obviously he used this stonking great Chrysler V8, 375 horsepower SAE, which is a bit, little bit lower in European measurements, I think 20% lower actually, but that's not what this car is about anyway. It's about the torque. So incredible drivability, but as well as that, one of the other criticisms his clients told him about Ferrari is he used to take the car over the Alps, it would start to overheat. So, you know, you'd have to stop, put snow in the, over the engine to cool it down. So what they did is they used a huge radiator at the front to make sure that cooling was adequate and this, this car could really be used. And of course, from America, incredible air conditioning that was literally would freeze you within a few seconds. There are a couple of downsides to the design though. He put the engine really far back in the cabin to try and get the right handling. He was after all a racing driver, so he knew what he wanted from the car. And also the massive air conditioning unit here. Both of those things give you a huge console there and a driving position quite unlike any other that I've experienced in the car. In one way, the steering wheel is further left, I think, than I've ever seen. But the seat bolster kind of is edging your body to the right while the pedals again are offset to the left. So it's a little bit odd when you first sit in the car. I think as I'm driving, I'm getting more used to it. As mentioned, it's really more about the um, the torque this engine and it is effortless it really is <laughs> the Americans are right there's nothing like cubic inches really is there so chassis wise this is also quite interesting because it's not particularly advanced at the time it's got a Salisbury rear axle independent front end and the way it drives is it feels as if the suspension perhaps has a little bit less travel than most other cars of this era. So initial behavior over bumps, that kind of stuff is good. When you're throwing it around a little bit, there's a bit of initial movement, but then it's pretty well controlled. It just doesn't have the range of movement of other similar cars. I think Aston's of this era, even the Ferraris just have a little bit more range. But for a car of this era with big sidewalls like this, it's actually quite well controlled on the corners. And also the steering is fascinating because Richard told me it's one of the things he really liked about this car. It's got really nice steering. And I was surprised because it's basically got a ZF steering box. So again, not particularly advanced. It's not particularly quick steering, but I can see what he means. This one I think is well set up because for a steering box, there really isn't much play, you know, on the straight ahead, which is what tends to dog them. But also, although it's not fast, once you're in the corner, it's just really happy to change direction. I think that's a legacy of having the engine so far back that it makes it quite yieldy, quite maneuverable, especially for something of this size. Now, there are a couple of bits which aren't original about this car. Well, not original in the traditional sense, but one is this gearbox cover here, the plate. I think the original one was plastic. I think he said that it melted in the sun. So he's changed it for that, but this is a temporary arrangement. But also the stickers on the side, they, they're not original. They were from another Monteverdi, which came after this, which I think was made in very limited numbers. Uh, I think another sports car called the HAI, the High. But they have been on this car for 30 years. So Richard decided that 
you know, it's his version of keeping it original. And I, I think they look quite nice and they suit it. And I love the fact that this is red because these bigger cars, you tend to get them, you know, in the silvers, in the darker colors. And it's really, really nice to see it in this lovely cherry red. In terms of handling, it's more fun to drive than the equivalent DBS, but it doesn't really suffer in terms of uh, its abilities as a GT car. So I'm really quite impressed with it. The one thing I would say is the brakes don't feel very strong, but this is an older car. Now they did go with all disc brakes on this, but perhaps this setup needs pepping up a bit, or perhaps they just weren't that great. I don't know. It's one of the main elements that I think, for me anyway, ages it. The steering is nice and light, so again, if you compare it to DBS or a Daytona or one of those cars, it's a completely different experience to drive. Uh, but, you know, in terms of the performance elements of it, it doesn't seem to suffer. So I think the big question is, this was an extremely expensive car. I think only the Rolls-Royce Corniche cost more back in the day. Having driven it today, do I think it's worth it? I think the answer is yes. Now there are people who poo-poo cars like this because they have the American V8s and they think that it devalues them in comparison to Ferraris and Lamborghinis, which have their more highly strung, more thoroughbred Italian engines. But I don't really subscribe to that. I think that there is absolutely nothing wrong with these American engines. As a matter of fact, I really like them. They have own, their own distinctive characters. They drive in their own distinctive way. And even today as a classic, although these are worth a lot of money, I think, you know, they've from between two to four hundred thousand pounds to get to get one. That engine has the added benefit that, you know, if anything breaks or you need to sort of keep it updated, it doesn't cost a fortune. You know, they're simple units. They do what you need to do. The design, I think, was really interesting. It's it's striking from all angles. It looks, I think, quite beautiful and quite brutal from some. And it's certainly a very exclusive car as well. Thank you so much, Richard, for bringing this down. This is the same chap who owns the Lamborghini silhouette. Uh, so I really appreciate you coming down and bringing this car. To everybody else, if you want me to do a review on one of your car, you know, I do love this sort of 70s Exotica, whether they're Maseratis or lesser known cars or Ferraris or whatever. Uh, do get in touch with me and we'll see if we can arrange something. Um, thank you all so much for watching. If you haven't already subscribed to the channel, please do. And I really look forward to seeing you for the next video.